Hello everyone, uh, my name is Victor Pires, uh, I'm from centropicgardener.com and the reason that I'm here today is to present on what I'm calling the centropic worldview uh, or perhaps a, a conceptual framework of that underlines centropic farming practices and the reason, there is a few reasons why I would like to present that framework to you today. Uh, first and foremost is because I think that is not being, it's kind of being lost in translation. Uh, it's much easier to find that content perhaps within Portuguese resources, but still there, it's not very easy. Um, a lot of that content I've been gathering through all the many courses I've done uh, and a lot of research I've I have done as well uh, and I have to put this together in the way that I see to fit it all in a logical, logical, perhaps rational way uh, which I think will help many, I'm hoping that it will help many to start thinking differently to me the biggest challenge that we have at the moment um, is how can we change our thinking, how can we start to see our place in the world differently because the, the thinking that has taken us to the place that we are now with all those problems um, requires a different quality of thinking to find solutions and I think that this framework provides a very elegant way that allow us very tangibly to start seeing the world differently and perhaps where our function is within that microorganism. Uh, another reason is because if you look at the, cont uh, the questions that people keep asking um, such as oh, what should I plant of my piece of land, what is the spacing of such and such plant, when should I come and manage, all those questions are very context specific and unfortunately or perhaps fortunate the only person that can truly answer those questions is the person that is asking. And that's because from my understanding as from my practices and from what I've seen other regenerative practice in other properties it seems to me that all those regen egg practices are very 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 context specific in a sense that the human being that is behind or that family that is behind needs to forge a very caring relationship to their piece of land. Uh, it has to be, I, you know, the human being needs to be a steward to that land and for that as well there is so many variables uh, in the skills, resources, knowledge, climate, so on and so forth that only that human being will really be able to provide those answers and so I'm hoping that by understanding that then people are not afraid to go out and start to try things and start to collect and start to gather the answers to our own questions because that's what we need to do I think we need to start questioning things and then trying to find those answers within our own context so we can move forward and finally the third reason is because entropic farming um, has almost now became, become the answer to all questions in terms of how do we solve climate change in tropic farming, in tropic farming, how do we solve this in tropic farming to the point that it almost has this religious belief that uh, all you need to do is put some eucalyptus, some bananas together and off you go, you can grow anything, anywhere and you know terminology such as planting water make people believe that you can even go in the middle of the desert without the irrigation and off you go and the reality is really not like that there is a lot of activity there is a lot of human participation that is required through practices to observing through interacting to questioning that is required for this syntropic farming to eventuate and actually become something that is both regenerative and economically viable which is an art in itself so 
this framework that I will present, which is something that I have put together, uh, starts with that overarching idea, which is not unique to syntropic farming, that we are part of an organism that is actually a macro organism. So we are part of the Earth and the Earth is part of the solar system and this big entity we are part of it's all together moving towards some higher forms of consciousness of resources of whatever the microorganism is working towards we are part of it and one very specific quality that Ernest brings is that that microorganism is intelligent so it has a way of operating, there is an intelligence behind our way to work that will move it towards where you want to go, towards higher forms of life, of complexity, of um, diversification, so on. So I think that's very important for us to acknowledge that we are part of something bigger that not only allow us to be and evolve consciously um, in knowledge, in understanding, in practices, in relationships, but it's something that needs to be reciprocal as well, in my understanding. We need to also help it to achieve its goals. So we need to be a, a bit more humble, I believe, and grateful uh, for those forces that are there operating and moving everything together and help us to achieve our own goals, our own individual goals. Uh, so that macro-organism then uh, has a governing force. It has something that is, its, is the instrument uh, that it uses perhaps to move into higher realms and to continue to evolve. And that's something that it's called life. That it seems quite simple, just life. But life is something I find it very intriguing. Intriguing in many senses. I mean, if you look at the, the planet Earth in the middle of the cosmos, in the middle of the galaxies and so forth, we are so unique. And what makes us unique, it's really it's that life element, which is self-sustaining, self-creating, self-adjusting. It's a force that there is no one ruler, but everything is in equilibrium. We're trying to form a final equilibrium that never really is found for too much longer because things just keep moving. There is the nature of life, of movement. So life needs to be observed as a verb as living, as a living process that is always changing, is always evolving, is always growing. And we as human beings have the capacity to affect life with our chainsaws and tractors and bulldozers and so forth, but life also has an intrinsic quality of refining the equilibrium in which we don't really have a say. But it's something that we need to start to pay attention the life itself organizing. And there is one quality of life which is really fascinating, uh, and Victor Schauberg and many others have talked about it, is like there is a law within life, within living systems, that repetition is forbidden. Nothing gets repeated. Everything just keeps coming new day after day. And that's something that the human beings I find it struggle because we are used to pressing a button and that light always coming on. We are used to turning the tap on and that water always running. And we get in kind of interesting situations when we press the button and the light does not show, you know, does not light up. But that's how life works. Every day it's a new day. Every day something different. Some quality is different and that we need to start to work with. So life then, the way it operates in its movement, I think that's when we can start to talk about entropy and syntropy, which gives rises to syntropic farming. 
So entropy and syntropy are two polaris. They sit on the ends of the spectrums, for example, like many other things that we have. So one way that I find it easy to understand that entropy and syntropy is that entropy is something that is decaying and syntropy is something that is growing. So syntropy has a tendency to bring it together, to converge, to move into higher, more complex forms. Whereas entropy has that tendency to disperse, to lose, to let it go, to decay, to dissipate. And it's not that one is good and the other one is bad. The key thing for me is the movement in between those two. So life is always moving and life is always moving between processes of respiration, of breathing out and processes of inspiration, of breathing in. So we can't just be growing forever like we think in our economic models and we can't be destroying forever like we are in our industrial system. It needs to be a process that we have decay and then we have rebuilding through life processes into growth. And the more we start to have that process, then the bigger, the more energy we start to accumulate. And I think this is a very, is the fundamental principle. It's what Ernest Goethe called the catch jump. Is the dynamic movement between entropic process and syntropic processes. And what entropic farming does, it speed that process through our human participation. So we have an, or an organism that is macro. We have life at its governing forces. So we need to have some structure, inverted commas, on how all those myriad life forms are interacting. And the first, first two key concepts is unconditional love and cooperation. Meaning that, you know, through unconditional love to the self perhaps sacrifice of giving your own work for a higher process, for a higher purpose, and through cooperation, all those life forms are moving the macro-organism towards higher realms. And we really need to understand that. This is a very key change in our thinking and how we relate to the natural world that allow us to start to find proper solutions to our current problems. Unfortunately, the systems that we have operating in our society, it's completely based on, co on competition. It's what Darwin presented as the survival of the fittest. And although, you know, you could, you could see some of those relationships in nature, the vast majority is about cooperation and about unconditional love. It's by far, if you start to observe how plants and animals and minerals are operating and working together, cooperation is the underlying motivation behind that. You know, that's where we're going. So these are the higher principles. These are kind of the overarching rules of engagement within life forms. And so also within relationships, then, if you want to be cooperating, in my understanding, how Ennis present, is that we need to communicate. Something that is not easy, and we human beings have massive problems with that, and believing that what we say or what we think or our opinion is the final opinion. But everything in nature is communicating through different organs, different senses, different ways. But everything needs to communicate in order to cooperate. If I don't communicate with you and you don't communicate with me, then how do I know where you're going? How do I know how can I help you or how you can help me? We must communicate. So we must start to think how are things communicating over there? And perhaps the final and the lower form of relationship. So that's the overall, this is kind of intra-interspecific in species. And then each individual has a motivation 
which then is caused an internal pleasure to operate under this overarching idea and governing force, which is also very important that there is a reward, a internal pleasure for our participation. So within that framework then, how does life move towards higher, higher forms of life? Well, its driving force is natural succession. And what is natural succession? Basically, is a movement in time and space. So nature organizes itself, all the plants, through a framework of time that spans, you know, da -da 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 -da, since the beginning of times and soon till forever, and it organizes itself in space as well. So with that, we are then able to create higher forms of life and make the most of our sunlight. So, in my understanding, we think that driving force and is breaking breaks it down into more or less four broader categories. So the first one are those systems, the biggest systems, abundance, colonization, accumulation, and then within those systems we have a, another breakdown into placenta, uh, secondary, climax, transitional, and then we're starting to get a bit smaller onto the time factor, into the specific plant life cycles, let us 30 days, banana one to two years, three perhaps, and that kind of stuff. And finally, we have that space dynamics, which are the different stratas. I'm not going to get into details here, but that's how it gets more and more fine-tuned with the space dynamics, but it goes from very small that keeps repeating and reciprocating holes within holes, and they get bigger through natural succession. That is the driving force, and that operates throughout the planet. It doesn't really matter if you are in the middle, under the ocean, in the middle of the desert, in the temperate climate, in the subtropics, wherever you are, if it's cold or if it's hot, it's irrelevant. There is always an underlying driving force, which is called natural succession, which simply means time and space keep moving in an orderly fashion. And so once we understand all of that, now, with our intelligent capacity, we become the organizing force. So, through our organization, because if you look at nature, it's quite chaotic in a sense. But we can bring a very different quality to nature that it doesn't have. So we can help it fulfill its functions as well, in the same way that it helps us to fulfill our functions. So when it comes to the organizing force, which is kind of our actions, to me, the most or the first step is that we really understand where we are. What is our context? What's our land? What's our climate? What is the fauna and flora that are present? What are my skills? What is my knowledge level? Who can I count? Who don't? What are my resources? Ta, 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 ta. That very context specific that I was talking in the beginning, that needs to show up now because we need to put that into here. And then as we do that, we are able to create a design. So we are able to put that theory, which is not so much as a theory, is as something conceptual, but it's something that is very big with so many variables within our context which has a lot of variables and we put them together and we create a design which is still conceptual but it's starting to take starting to become meta it's starting to materialize into something real but we cannot stop there and to be honest to be talking a lot about design it's not really the key either for me and we seem to spend a lot of time on that on a specific why is the spacing of the letters and I will do that design and I'll have a plant in 30 days and 60 days, 90 days and 120 days and there is a lot of energy being spent in the design which is important but it's not such a critical part in my understanding because then we need to implement and from my experience the implementation part will always 
differ from design. You can be, have done the most thorough design when it comes to implementation. You know, the rock was uh, the, the the ground was rocky. I couldn't get all the plants that I needed. Da 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 da. You know, it rained too much. Didn't rain enough. There was a wallaby that came over, or you know, all those macro variables start to come into place into our implementation, how this design gets translated into reality. And then a lot of people stop here. They think that, okay, I've implemented, I've planted my beds, I've planted my systems, I've done it. No. This is 0.00001% of the task, in my understanding. It's not even 5% as, you know, you can see people talking. It's, it, this is minimal in relationship to that. Management is where you, as the organizing force behind the macro-organism, can make sure that those operating, that all that syntropic worldview comes into fruition with you. You are the organizer. You need to participate in that system. That is very, very critical. And that is, you need to water those plants, and you need to harvest those plants, and you need to manage that system so this moves between entropy and syntropy in the most elegant and natural and quiet and simple way possible. So this, I'm going to end here. This is the Syntropic worldview as I understand. Uh, I hope this has been helpful to you and that allows you to see the bigger picture and where our actions come from. That if we spend too much time here, we're kind of missing a bit. We need to understand that. But what I really hope is that this start to just change your thinking a little bit or just open up the possibility that perhaps things are a little bit different than we are thought in school. And that we are that we have the courage to go outside and implement those ideas and drive them and organize them through that natural successional process and communicating and unconditional love and coming back into those when the past come and eats our broccoli, we come back into here and try to understand where was the fault? What have I done that I missed the relationship? It's not a matter of going out there and annihilating life just so you can have a broccoli, but it's understanding how nature is communicating with you through those pests and disease to say, hey, perhaps your land is not as abundant as you thought it was or perhaps this, or perhaps that. And then it's up to you to interact with that natural piece of the planet. I hope that was useful. I hope to see you soon. I hope to expand those bigger, you know, there's a lot of information within each you know, of those that I bring into my understanding that I would like to share with you. And I hope to do so in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to know a bit more about me, just go to syntropicgardener.com. There is a bit of information about over there. Send us an email uh, and let's get that information flowing. That's got our thinking going. And it's very important that we start to share what we've done, what we observed, and how things reacted. We need to start talking about realities, about real things we've done and observed not so much about the design and the concept concept can only go so far we do need to step into reality and share let's share let's communicate let's love each other let's cooperate and together through that movement we'll get out of this mess i hope to see you soon thank you very much <music>